You are listening to the F11 Photography Podcast. Chasers of light to the purveyors of pictures to all of you listening around the world. This is the F11 Photography Podcast. I am your host, Kevin Deal, along with your co host, Mr. Brandon Gorey. Oh, hello, everyone. How are we doing? We are doing well. Uh, Today's episode is going to be some pretty awesome stuff. We're going to talk about pricing yourself as a photographer. I did want to remind each and every one of you listening that you can check us out at f11pod.com. F11pod is our handle on both Instagram and Twitter. You can follow us on all major podcast platforms, but you already knew that because if you downloaded this and you're listening to it, you probably got us on one of those major platforms to begin with. Uh, we also have YouTube channels, Kevin Deal, Brandon Gorey, Photography. So if you want, if you like the things that we talk about on this uh, podcast and you like the way Brandon, uh, his, his approaches and so on and so forth, he's got a YouTube channel. If you like the way I have my approach, I've got my own YouTube channel. We have educational content on film and all other things. So yeah, go check those out if you want to learn more about uh, our philosophies on photography. But today's episode is sponsored by Luminar. Neo, which is artificial intelligence, which I know artificial intelligence is all the rage, but this is not hyperbole. It actually has some really cool AI modules like power line removal, relight, um, spot AI, mask AI, noiseless AI, background removal. You can uh, take people's eyes and make them bigger. You can instantly make people's eyes turn green if they're brown, or you can make them have cat eyes. There's all sorts of really cool modules that save you time if you don't want to go through all the steps in Photoshop. And by the way, speaking of Photoshop, uh, Luminar Neo works as a plugin within Photoshop. It works as a plugin within Lightroom. You can also use it as a standalone program. Maybe you don't like Lightroom. Maybe you don't like Capture One. Maybe you don't like all these other programs that are out there and you're trying to find a program to organize your catalog with, uh, something that has layers built into it, some pretty intelligent editing. Uh, Go check out Luminar. Uh, We have a link in the description below where you can get 10% off. But on today's episode, we are going to be talking about pricing yourself as a photographer. Uh, Brandon correctly pointed out in our very first episode that there's a lot of photographers out there who are uh, businessmen trying to be photographers, and then there are photographers trying to be businessmen. And I can't tell you how many photographers I know who are brilliant at a camera. They take amazing pictures, but when it comes to things like knowing what to charge, fucking clueless. They don't know what they're worth. They're like, oh, I think I'm worth like $100 or whatever. And I look at their work. I'm like, bro, you could be charging $2,000 for this job. And, and then on the flip side of that, I know mediocre photographers that absolutely clean house and make shit tons of money because they just know what to do. So what we're going to hopefully try to get to the bottom of in this episode is tips to help you as a photographer to make more money because we spend all of our time uh you know, on the artsy side and buying gear and all this and trying to improve ourselves and, and trying to get better. But none of us spend a lot of time, or I should say many of us don't spend a lot of time uh, trying to improve the business side. And if your goal is to be a professional photographer who makes your sole income off of photography, you need to get your shit together when it comes to running your business. So let's talk about running a business. I uh, hear all the time that there are these photographers who devalue themselves. I see it, these photographers who devalue themselves. So someone approaches you and they're like, hey, I want to do a photo shoot out in a field for my family. What do you charge? And that's when you freeze up and you're like, oh, I don't know what to do. I don't know how much to price this at. And then you make the mistake of maybe going and looking at your competition and seeing what they charge. And uh, you're like, oh, well, they charge $500. So I'm going to 
charge 350 and undercut them. Ha 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 ha. I'm so smart. I'm great at business. And then you wonder why your checking account uh, hits an overdraft fee, uh, whatever. So uh, I don't recommend you look at what others are doing, uh, especially if they don't live in your town, because it's an arbitrary number. What I feel personally you should base your pricing on is what do you need to live? What do you need for retirement? What, how much money do you need to set aside for groceries? How much money do you need to set aside for certain things? Figure that out. Base your numbers off that. If you have the talent, uh, you can make it work. And so uh, I tell people all the time, like, value yourself based off of what it's worth to you, what you're worth. And uh, I see people all the time also who, like, they do the the undercut, right? But the, what they don't realize is that they're creating a shitty market for themselves. So, like, I'm not using these numbers as like concrete numbers that you should base your numbers off of. You shouldn't because this is literally arbitrary. But let's say somebody comes up to you. Let's say you're a good photographer and hopefully you are. Someone comes up to you and they're like, how much are you going to charge to take my family out into a field and take pictures of us? And you go, I'm going to charge you a hundred dollars. And then somebody comes up to me and asks me, how much are you going to charge to take my family out into a field and take pictures? And I'm going to say a thousand dollars. And they're going to say, no thanks, you're too expensive. And they're going to walk away. And you're going to go, ha, sucker, you priced yourself too high. But I didn't. I'm worth $1,000. And this is arbitrary, but I'm saying I'm worth $1,000. It's okay that they said no because you know what? The next, If the next nine people say no and I get that one yes, and let's say 10 people say yes to you at $100, we both just made $1,000 and I did a tenth the amount of work that you did. And you know what's going to happen? Those people who you charged $100 are going to be bird dogs for you. It's going to be great. They're going to go out and they're going to go find you more business and go, oh, wow, they took so many great pictures. It was so amazing. They only charged $100. Now you become a $100 photographer. Everybody's going to approach you about $100 jobs. Meanwhile, me over here charged $1,000. I made the same amount of money as you, but I did a tenth the amount of work. And that person, maybe they won't recommend me to 10 people, but they're going to recommend me to two people who know that I'm a thousand dollar photographer. And now I have $3,000 off of those two recommendations. Cause they know two people who value a thousand dollar photographer. Then there's the other aspect of it. People who are bottom feeders, as I call them, the hundred dollar customer are the ones who bitch and whine the most about edits. Because if you find someone who will pay you a thousand dollars to take shots of their family out in the field, then you're clearly worth it to them to be someone who gets paid a thousand dollars. And if you, if they see the value in paying you a thousand dollars, in my experience, they're less likely to be super picky about their edits and bitch and moan. It's the people who who, who are the hundred dollar customers who bitch and moan and want the most ed amount of edits. So I said that it was 10 times less work, but it's probably, it's probably, uh, more than that because the, the, the cheaper customers are the ones who bitch and moan the most and create the most extra work for you and post. I found that people that pay the higher dollar amounts, like when you send them their first round of edits, a lot of times they're like, great. And that's it. It's like you're done and you're like, holy shit, I just, I just made that thousand dollars. Great. All life is good. So there's something about pricing yourself, what you're worth, have the confidence. Don't be afraid to be rejected because you're trying to create and establish a market for yourself. You want to be the thousand dollar photographer, not the hundred dollar photographer. And then as you work up through the tiers, you then become the $2,000 photographer or the $3,000 photographer. Brandon, in your experience, is what I'm saying, does that, is that, is that, is that kind of compatible with your experiences? I've been on both sides and it is way, 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 way too true. Um, you know, it's funny what you didn't mention is that even if you are a good photographer and you are regarded by your community as one of the photographers in your immediate community that fucking gets it done and that is, is constantly evolving, growing, and you have that recognition when you like that community speaks, right? And if someone out of that community, uh, a friend of another photographer, a friend of another stylist, a friend of a friend, you know, like you, your name gets thrown around and they look at your work and they ask what your prices are nine times out of 10, they're expecting a, they're expecting a good price. And what, what I mean by good price is not a cheap price. They're expecting your price to be equal to your work. In fact, I've had people, uh, when I used to underprice myself, I had people 
get a little bit disillusioned and a little bit concerned with how the shoot was going to come out because I underpriced myself. They're like, they're like, what do you, what do you mean this shoot would like, okay. So I charged $200 for a shoot that, um, ultimately I, I got out of it making like $2 and 50 an hour. If that I put a lot of work into it and I just thought that like, I wanted to, I wanted to give them the most bang for buck and it's bad psychology. You think it's good psychology because the reciprocation, you think people will be grateful. Um, People aren't grateful at that price level. People are, if, if that's how much they, they can pay for a shoot, they're trying to squeeze as much out of you as possible. And you're trying to do the least amount as possible because you feel like you were unjustly paid because you price yourself that way. And they're also like, okay, how are you like, how are you charging this much? If your photo work is this good, you know, they sense a lack of confidence in you right off the bat. And suddenly they're questioning, they have questions in the back of their mind about how the shoot's going to go. Yeah. It's, it, people fall into this trap too, where it's like, you know, nobody picks up a camera on day one and starts charging. They go learn and they go play and they get better and better and better. And it might be 10 years before they're like, I'm a professional. I'm, I'm, I'm good enough to charge now, but where they fall into a trap is like, well, I just started charging. So I should charge so little. It's like, right. But you have 10 years of experience as a photographer. You should be charging the same rate that somebody who's been photographing for 10 years charges because you have 10 years of experience as a photographer. So base your rates, I mean, base your rates off of what you need to live, but base your rates on the fact that you are a, a, a decade long experienced photographer. Just because you just started charging now doesn't mean that you char you start at the bottom. It's how good you are. They, the people people think that it's like, oh, I haven't been doing this business part of it long, so I shouldn't charge a lot. It's like, no, it should be, it should be equal to your talent levels and how good you are. And of course, the problem is, is that a lot of us uh, as photographers are complicated, tortured artists, and we have no idea of self-worth. We have the imposter syndrome and all that. And so, you know, I, I, I get it. I totally get it. But to my point I was making earlier, do not uh, devalue yourself. And I see, you know, there's other people out there who are business people who do mediocre work, but because they know the business side of things so well, they can charge shitloads of money for mediocre work and they're just cleaning up. And meanwhile, you're over here way more talented than them. And you just don't know your head from your ass when it comes to business. And that's, that's the, the point I'm trying to get across to you, the listener. If you're somebody who struggles with how to price your photography is you need to understand that I'm good. I'm good enough to charge. And so now I should charge based off my experience level of photography, not your experience level of business. Charge off your experience level of photography because you do that level of work. To Brandon's point that he made earlier, which was if you charge too little, you'll oftentimes lose the job because they're not looking for a cheap photographer. They're looking for a good photographer. And then they get confused because they see good work, but they're like, there's no way he can be good if he's charging $200. I was expecting it to be $1,200, right? And oftentimes, you know, it's, I know it's scary, but just try it. Cause a lot of times you, you know, you'll be like, Oh my God, I'm about to charge $1,200. And guess what? The next thing you receive back is great. What are your payment terms? And you're like, Holy shit, I just paid $1,200 and it'll build your confidence up. You got to do that. Another thing I, I highly recommend, and, and this is a controversial point of topic because this is not, uh, across the board. Not everybody does this, but I don't do this. I do not post my prices anywhere. And here's why. There's this concept called price anchoring. The second somebody sees a number, their mentality is that they anchor into that number. It doesn't matter if you go, but you need this and this and this and this and this. And that's all very different than that number that you saw. Their mentality, they are anchored into that number. And now you have a negotiation point you have to start at. But if they don't know what your number is and they go, and you just send them a quote, like I use QuickBooks, okay? And so I, I you know, people are like, hey, your prices aren't on your website. I'm like, yes, that's true because no two shoots are exactly the same. And if I show you a price, you're going to think that it's going to cost that. And you, it may cost three times that much. And I, I, that's just that's just the way I do it. And, and so... I ask people like, Hey, what do you need? And they're like, Hey, we're doing like uh, three looks. Uh, you know, I, I want a bunch of portfolio shots, uh, with like three beauty shots that are retouched. Well, retouching takes me a really long time. So I calculate my rates based off of that. And I go, okay, this is what the shoot's going to cost. I go and I figure out how much work I'm going to do. And then I come back with a number. I don't sit there and go, Hey, three looks, 
uh, you know, well, I don't have a menu. Now I do have a menu upon request because modeling agencies require it. So I do have a price sheet, but I don't put that price sheet out in public. I, I hold on to it and I, and I send it to people when they need it. But oftentimes I find that I can negotiate a much higher rate if I don't give people upfront prices. I go, well, based off the fact that I'm doing this and this, I put a big long ass list together for them of all the things that I'm doing, it'll come out to this. And then I give them a number. And oftentimes they're like, okay, that makes sense. Let's do it. But if I give them a rate sheet and they see, you know, let's say it's a, a shoot, I'm charging somebody $5,000, but they see a $3,000 thing on my website. It's really fucking hard to convince people once they see $3,000 to spend $5,000. But if it's a, if it's a shoot that you think is worth $5,000 and you just give them a quote out of QuickBooks, it's $5,000. It's way easier to convince them than if they see something in writing with your, your letterhead on it saying that, oh yeah, my rate sheet says that this is $3,000. And it's like, well, we only changed two or three components. It's like, yeah, but that's like, several intense beauty edits, which are more expensive. And, and then they're like, well, now three beauty edits cost like whatever, $500 a piece or whatever. You know, you don't want to show people too much of what goes on under the hood with your business. You need to charge what you need to charge and you need to have the confidence to deliver it that the people think that you're worth that. Yeah. And something, something I learned from working as a project manager for a construction company. Um, when you, when you go out to an estimate, and you see what they want, uh, whether it's a, like a pergola, a fence, a deck, whatever the hell it is, um, you're putting your estimate together later that night. And the itemized list that you're writing, if, if you're charging them a premium price and you're, uh, you know, you're a premium photographer, you want to itemize everything that they're getting. You want them to be on your side and understand all the work that you're going to be putting into it. You know, if you're doing beauty edits, you know, and you're charging more like itemize, you know, high end retouching, you know, color grading, you know, color sciences, lighting, you know, that, all, that whole sort of thing. Um, in terms of pricing, I know a lot of people will talk about like, okay, so if they're paying for a Photoshop subscription on the monthly, include that in the price. You don't want to include that in the price. You, people don't want to know that they're paying for your means to the end. Um, but definitely include it as, you know, uh, labor or materials. I do put mileage. If, if anything is more than 30 miles out of Austin, I put mileage. And I go, I'm charging you 55 cents a mile. And that is, that is what I write off of my taxes too. But yes, really? Th- absolutely I will. Because gas, I mean, gas is three and a half dollars a gallon. You're fucking right. I'm going to put that in there. It's like, if you're going to make me travel 75 miles outside of where I live, I'm putting mileage as a line item on there because you got to understand that there are costs associated with this because anybody can relate to gas prices they're like, oh yeah, of course you're sh- you're driving seventy five miles out of your 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 hometown to get to this wedding we're doing. And of course, of course, gas is going to be a line item on there. For from a marketing standpoint, I'd probably factor that in and sprinkle it across multiple different. You know, like uh, <laughs> it, it wouldn't be under travel. I'd just make retouching an extra thirty dollars, something else an extra ten. But the reason why I line item it is because it's easier to justify the extra expense. If I hide it. I'm like, why is your retouching so high or whatever? And it's like, because I'm hiding my mileage in there. But if I just put my mileage, like mileage is in there. You know, I, I just put uh, in my contract, I just say anything more than 30 miles outside of the city limits of Austin, I charge 55 cents a mile. Oh, that's really interesting. I, hey, what it doesn't it doesn't necessarily work for everybody. That That's what works for me. Um, you know, I had a, there's a town called Fredericksburg that's like an hour and a half away. And I did an engagement shoot and I said, yes. I'm going to put that in there. Oh, we're doing it at uh, 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 Texas State Park. It's like, okay, well, I'm going to put the fee of the Texas State Park in there. I looked it up, and it's $8 to get in. I put that in there. That's production costs. It's no different than doing a commercial job, and it's like, hey, this commercial job requires three pro photo lights. I I can't afford three pro photo lights right now, and I don't want to go out and buy three pro photo lights, so I'm going to go figure out a rental fee. Um, I'm going to use my local shop, and I'm going to put – Production costs, light rentals, because you need specific types of lights for this specific type of shoot, and that's my production costs. And we'll get in, we'll get into commercial photography in a bit because commercial photography is way crazier than taking somebody out in a field and taking their pictures. Uh, we'll get into all that here in a bit. But, um, but back to what I was talking about with uh, price anchoring, uh, people will like dig their heels in when they see prices, and 
uh, one of the other reasons, the, one of the big reasons why I implore you not to go look up your competition's prices and then uh, put your prices based off of their prices is because they're just as clueless as you are when they come up with those prices, unless they are actually going in and calculating their operation expenses and adding things like how much salary they want to take, how much retirement they want to take. Uh, and maybe they're paying off a lens. They're putting people who know what the fuck they're doing. That's how they calculate how much to charge you. Most photographers are creatives and they don't know. They're just, they're just going off to somebody else's site and seeing what they charge them. Well, then I'm going to charge that too. But the problem with that is that your competition doesn't have the exact same situation as you. Are you paying off the same lens that they're paying off? No. Do you pay rent at the same place that they pay rent at? No. How much money do you have put aside for retirement versus how much money they have put aside for retirement? How far along are you on your journey? That's what you should be basing your pricing on. You, it's arbitrary to go look at somebody else's pricing. That just lets you know that that's what my competition charges. But there's no under the hood uh, justification for those expenses. You don't know why they're charging what they're charging. And that's why you shouldn't look at it because it does nothing for your situation. It does nothing for your retirement. It does nothing for paying off your loan. I mean, it, it, it does it does allow you to charge, but it, there's no numbers to tie it to. And so you have to look at your numbers. And point being, as I said earlier in the episode, if you're worth it, you will find the people who will pay it. It may take you a while to find and establish your customer base, but once you have a customer base that is willing to pay your price and go be bird dogs for you and recommend you to other people, you are now building your business base off of the, the price that you need to build it off of, not off of some arbitrary number you pulled off the internet. And by the way, you need to make sure it's even in your geographical region because if you go look up somebody in Indianapolis and you live in San Francisco, very different costs of living there. Um, very different uh, markets there. Not even the same styles of photography are typically shot in those two cities. So you really can't rely on others to determine your own destiny. You know, you can kind of like figure out that, oh, if I'm following this person who does two looks, they charge this much. But if they do three or four looks, they charge that much. Maybe you go, oh, okay, I double my price because I'm doubling my looks. Maybe you can use that as a basis. But the actual number that you tie it to needs to be based off of your needs, not somebody else's arbitrary numbers. You are listening to the F11 Photography Podcast. Adding to your point about, you know, style of photography, you know, and it's really artist to audience relationship. You can't compare yourself to other people because they're not going to have your style of photography. So if someone's seeking you out, um, oftentimes when people seek me out, they'll tell me like, I love your work. Um, I, I sought you out because, you know, I want your style of photography. I want you to shoot what you shoot and include me in it. That's, that's kind of what they want. I want your style for myself. Um, then you know that like, okay, they're, they're asking for you. You are unique to them. They want your recipe, um, for them, which, you know, that there's a whole other conversation about shooting models versus non-models who just want to look like a model. But if they are a model and that's what they're looking for, or I charge them more, by the way, I charge them twice as much. Go on. The non-models. Yes. I charge the non-models twice as much because they're twice as much work. Yeah. No kidding. Um, but yeah, so you can maintain a higher price point as well because people want something unique to you. So if you are the artist and most artists are looking for something unique, a lot of businessmen, they just sort of find a niche and they just replicate and replicate and replicate. And it's just like a churn and burn strategy. You know, they spend more time networking than they do researching um, artistic uh, methodologies. And so, you know, stay true to yourself. Um if you have cornered a market for a specific look, a specific style, and you even have like, you know, a noticeable philosophy on what you shoot and just a mood in general, that is your brand. And so oftentimes people will be paying for your brand and brands charge premium prices for premium products. And that's what you are. If you're a wedding photographer, it's highly likely that you're choosing between one of five different style presets where the where, you know, it's either you either have the wintergreen greens with the high whites or maybe it's a warmer thing, but you're churning and burning. You're not a, you know, you're not a brand. Your branding comes down to customer experience at that point. They're using the Vanessa Joy Capture One presets, which by the way, uh, Vanessa is a neighbor of mine. She's super cool. And she does have actually good wedding presets, just throwing that out there. So if you shoot weddings, you want presets, free advertisement. But um, the, the thing is, there's a lot of people out there who... 
one thing that I find that doesn't work for me, and I see people do this, like, we're going to do mini sessions out in the field, and I'm going to do, like, I have five slots available from this time to this time, and, you know, I'm going to do it at this highly discounted rate because I'm doing it all in one fell swoop, but you're, you're still taking, like, hundreds of pictures of families, and it's like, no, like, I, I know it's, like, a cheap way to try to get people, but once again, it comes back to the, oh, you're doing mini sessions for $50 of families out in blue bonnets. Now you've just created five clients who think that you're worth $50 and, and, and they're going to go out and go, yeah, we, she did this amazing work and she did it for $50. Like now you're going to have people knocking on your door for $50. And, and then you create another problem for yourself because what will happen is you will analyze your business and you'll be like, I am charging too little. I have to raise my rates. Well, you know who it's the most difficult to raise your rates with? People who have already paid you because they already have established a price based off of what you charge. You're like, well, you're, you're a $50 photographer. That's what you charge, right? So how, why, you know, you're trying to charge me $250. How do you raise your rates five times, you know, like five times higher than it was. And, you know, I, I run into this sometimes, um, like there's a college that I, I, I hired me out back in October, um, and they hired me out they, uh, in three weeks. I have to go do some more work for them. And I said, hey, I appreciate it. I'm glad you guys loved using me last time. But my operating expenses have gone up 15% because of inflation and gas and food. And I got to put money on my, you know, food on my table and all that. And so I had the awkward conversation. I was like, hey, look, uh, I'm going to do the exact same job for you guys, but I have to charge 15% more. Businesses tends to be a little bit more understanding about this because their operating expenses have also raised 15%. So it's a little easier conversation, but you have to be super like nuanced in how you have, the, have that conversation. One way around it is you need to start charging new clients more to make up for what your old clients are. And then that brings us to something else, which is firing clients. Do not be afraid to fire clients. Uh, because if you think about, if I put three hours into a job that I charge $50 for, and I put three hours into a job that I charge $250 for, what's your rate of return? I made five times more doing the exact same amount of work. Cut the dead weight. Cut out that $50 customer and focus on your higher end clientele who will go and recommend you to higher end clientele. Don't worry about pleasing them. Just say, hey, look, my, my business is growing. And if the $50, if the $50 client reaches out to you and asks you, hey, why are your rates so high now? It's like my operating expenses have gotten much more expensive. I'm doing much higher end work now that I have to charge more for. And I apologize if I am out of your range now, but that is where I am at right now as a business. I'm sure you understand. And then of course, oh, you know, if you have friends who are coming up in the business and, you know, then make sure they're not $50 photographers, make sure they're at least like hundred dollar photographers and be the good guy who's like, well, Hey, maybe I'm, overpriced now for you, but I do have someone I can recommend you to who is a really good photographer. Uh, maybe something to think about there. But the bottom line is, is you ha if you're going to run this as a business, you have to take care of yourself. Yeah. Another thing is don't compromise for business. If you're having a dry spell and someone reaches out to you and you're out of their budget and, you know, that thought will creep into the back of your head where you're just like, you know what? It's some money is better than no money. So you compromise, a, you know, let's say you're, you're doing a 500 shoot for just, you know, book building for someone who sends you the classic, Hey, I, I, I used to be in modeling. I've got like 12 years of experience and I just want to get back into it. And they think that you're the guy and, you know, they can only afford 200 and your, your regular, just simple book building price is 500 for like one look and like, you know, like a, one location. Don't compromise be, just because you need the work because first of all, you're going to hate yourself for doing it. Uh, nobody wants to spend the necessary amount of hours editing, knowing that they're going to get half the amount back. It's going to, it's, it's like, it's like a stressed cow, you know, a stressed cow produces hormones that give bad meat. You're going to feel less inclined to be diligent in your edits. You're going to feel less inclined to give out your usual quality of work. You're going to feel less inclined to, to hear what the model has to say about uh, what they want out of the photos, because at the end of the day, you know that they're not paying what they should be paying you. And it, it's just human nature. It's not on the model. Um, you know, those sort of things. It's, you know, they, they won't recognize very often that they're getting a good deal. A lot of models won't recognize that they'll still recognize the same service and the same level of quality, even if you're giving them a discount. And um, if you don't, 
you know, at, at the very least you should get clear to them and say like, Hey, like for this price, we're not doing any high end retouching, you know, at the most we're just clearing blemishes. Yes. That brings up another point. Um, make sure that you educate your clientele because clients don't know our terminology as photographers. They don't know the difference between an edit and a retouch. And it is your job when you talk to them in the discovery phase of whether or not you, whether or not you're even going to work together, it is your job to educate your client on here is what you're getting. These are your deliverables. You are getting whatever, 20 edits. And then you go, just to be clear, an edit is I am balancing the colors. I am balancing the exposure, the contrast, and doing it to what I feel looks best. The uh, pictures of mine that you fell in love with that caused you to hire me in the first place. I'm getting the pictures to kind of have that vibe as far as how bright they are, how much contrast, etc. That is what you pay for. If you want to retouch, this is where I go in and I do super uh, detailed edits of your skin. And that is an additional expense. So if at, after we are done shooting, if you want a retouch, you can add that on after the session. But since you don't know what we're about to shoot, you can make that determination when we finish, okay? That is what you need to do because what happens, I see these beginner photographers make this mistake so often is they don't tell the client what they're getting at the end. And so the client says, well, I guess they're gonna edit my face. And so they don't know the difference between an edit and a retest. So they're like, cool, so you're gonna edit my face? It's like, I did edit your face. I balanced the levels. It's like, well, I thought you meant you were going to like, you know, touch up my face. Like, no, no, that's extra. I'm like, why are you telling me this after I've agreed to pay you the deposit for this? And we've already done the fucking shoot. That's your fault. That's not your client's fault. You fucked up. So if you're listening to this and you know, you have to be a good communicator. Like when I communicate uh, to models about my uh, my my mono release, I have a, what I call a human conversation about the legal document. I tell them what's in that because nobody reads the contracts. But if I can say that I had a human conversation with you about a legal document and then I had you sign a legal document, I feel much better walking away from that shoot than I do if I just say sign this and I don't really explain what's in it. And Back to the uh, the pricing thing, though, is that if you do not communicate with your clients about deliverables, they're going to assume they're getting stuff that they're not getting. And you have to clearly define what they are and are not getting because th sometimes like they don't even understand what the difference is between a look. Like how many looks am I getting? What do you mean by looks? It's like how many clothing changes you get, okay? But within a look, there could be additional expenses. It's like, hey, I've got this look I want to do. I want you to take some portfolio shots of me, but I also want you to take beauty shots of me. It's like, okay, beauty to me is a different look. I mean, I don't care if you're wearing the same clothes you were wearing when I was taking full body shots of you. Beauty is a different look and every beauty retouch has a cost associated with it because I don't do frequency separation. I do dodge and burn. And on average, I spend an hour retouching a photo of a close up of somebody's face on average, an hour. And how much is an hour of your time worth? It was like Brandon was saying, he made all these promises and lowered his price. And at the end of the day, when he calculated his expenses, he was working for $2.50 an hour. And I've done the same thing early in my career. I've done the exact same thing. So we're all um, susceptible to this. We can all screw up. But the more educated we are going into this, the better off we'll be. You are listening to the F11 Photography Podcast. Moving on, we're going to talk about commercial work. Commercial photography is a very complex form of photography. It's very nuanced and it takes a lot of skill to get good at. But if you get good at it, you can clean house with how much you can charge. Five figures all day long for commercial projects. But the thing is, is companies, a lot of companies aren't educated on how commercial photography works. So for instance, I was approached by a company that makes uh, umbrellas. And they mainly sell all their umbrellas on Amazon. Well, you have to look at when you're pricing your commercial work, there's the, here's how much I charge to shoot for a day. Okay. And that's a part of what you charge. Then you have to figure out, okay, how much work am I going to have to do in post? Okay. That is uh, your editing, right? So you've got your production. And by the way, production can also include 
pre-production. So let's say you have to meet with your client three or four times to have production meetings in person and you have to drive and go down there. Well, you have to build your 55 cents a mile right off. This is where you would hide your mileage is if you're in the same town and you're driving back and forth, but you do build that in your production cost. Now, if you're doing a production that's way outside of the city, I would say you put your mileage back into it. And I think a company would completely understand that. Well, of course you have to drive a hundred miles to get here and you're charged for that. Companies are way more understanding of that than individuals. So that's fine. That's your production cost. You also have your uh, day cost for shooting. So there's half day rates and there's full day rates. And that's what your rate is. And that's what you need to use. What your day rate is, is based off your experience level. You could charge $800 a day. You could charge $1,600 a day. You could charge $20,000 a day. It all depends on who you're shooting for, the amount of experience you have, how, you know, are you a hired hotshot? And you probably be charging $20,000 a day. It just depends. And so uh, that's something you have to keep in mind. And that is your, uh, your shooting costs. And then back to your editing. What are you editing? So um, I had a client who was like, hey, we want you to take pictures of this medical facility. We want staged pictures in like 20 different rooms. It's like, okay, so that means that you need models. You need professional lighting. You need basically 20 sets built. That's going to take weeks to, to set up because I, you know, it's probably going to take me a couple hours per room. And you're talking about 30 rooms, so 60 hours worth of work just to shoot the rooms. Not to mention the fact that I need to mood board it and put together something ahead of time that's in the pre-production costs. And so, you know, you have to do that. And then in addition to that, they said, oh, and by the way, we have a staff of 150 professionals and we want headshots for all of them. I came back on that job with a $30,000 quote. And they just about shit themselves. But when I put pen to paper, how much work I was actually going to do, I had to I had to charge them thirty thousand dollars, and you know, they they declined. But the reason why my rate was so high is because you have to think about when a client uh, wants to book you for something, another expense you need to build into large projects. And I do this for weddings, by the way. You have to figure out how long you're going to be editing that wedding or how long you're going to be editing that commercial project. And then you have to also think about all the projects that are going to come knocking on your door in that time period that you're going to have to decline and you're losing money. I build that money, that lost money into my rates because I have to eat. I have to put a roof over my head. I have to save for my son's college. I have to save for retirement. That's all built into my rates. And yeah, the company I'm going to charge $30,000 to is going to pay that fucking rate. And so... That's how you have to price yourself in a commercial job. Additionally, in that job, I would need at least one assistant, if not two assistants for a job that large over the course of probably two weeks of shooting. Okay. So I have to give them my day rate. So let's just say you charge them like, you know, $1,600 a day to shoot, you know, and that's like 14 days right there. That's just your day rate right there is $30,000 just to, just to shoot. And then there's the editing. We haven't even gotten into the largest thing you charge, and that is your usage fee. Okay, now for this medical facility, the usage fee wasn't that big of a deal because it was more an internal photography thing. Like they're just putting their uh, website together and they're using stuff on a website. But going back to that umbrella company I talked about at the beginning of this section. So this umbrella company approached me and they said, We've hired photographers in the past and we've been very unhappy with them. We like your work. We want you to possibly shoot for us. What are your rates? And so I came back and I was like, okay, well, I went and looked up their stuff. And on Amazon alone, their umbrellas have 68,000 reviews. Reviews, not purchases, reviews. I don't review a lot of the things I buy on Amazon, maybe one one hundredth, but let's just be super conservative and say one out of every 10 things I buy on Amazon, I leave a review for. That means that if they use that conservative ratio, that means that they've sold 700,000 umbrellas, okay, on Amazon. If my picture is establishing the visual aesthetic for something that they are selling 700,000 units for, and they charge $39.99 for an umbrella, that means that my picture helped them achieve a gross sales of $2.79 million. 
my visual aesthetic help them just on Amazon. They probably sell direct. They probably sell in, um, what is that other one? Wayfair and Alibaba or whatever the, yeah, there's other places that sell their umbrella just on Amazon in gross sales. My visual aesthetic that they hired me to help them uh, establish to help them sell umbrellas on Amazon grossed them $2.8 million. Now let's say that they're operating sp- expenses. Let's say they make a two thirds profit. So uh, maybe they are only making, maybe it's only making them $1.8 million. And then of course they have their earnings before interest and all that. And they got to pay off all their wages and expenses and all that. But let's just say they're making a million dollars off of me. Okay. You're damn right I'm going to get paid for that because you have to establish how many eyes are seeing my photography and how much money is it making for my client because I see photographers fall into this trap all the time. They're like, well, I'll just charge you $100 to take your portrait. And then they take someone's portrait. And then the next thing you know, they see that person's portrait and they're like some lawyer and it's on a billboard in their town. They didn't ask them how they were going to use the material. That's your usage rate. The way you establish a usage rate you can go to a website. And so the one I use is called an AOP usage calculator. Now it's done in British pound sterling, but you can use the exchange rate to convert it to dollars. What you do is there's two different ways that you can do usage with commercial projects. One is you do a licensing fee. And two is that you do a copyright buyout. Copyright buyouts are very rarely elected to be used because they're usually super expensive because you're giving somebody the rights to your work. The other side of that is that you have a licensing fee. A licensing fee is you can use these images for a set period of time. And then once that license expires, you can repurchase the license for another longer period of time. And this sometimes works well with like clothing manufacturers and all that because they're seasonal, right? It's like, what are this season's clothes? Well, they may not even need a license for perpetuity because in two or three years, nobody's going to care about those clothes that you took a picture of because they've moved on to the next trendy thing. And so license may work very well there. So you have to establish um, how long they want to use your images for. Then you need to establish how they want to use the images. Are you going to be using these images on print? Yes. Are they internal documents or are they going to be marketing materials? Oh, they're going to be marketing materials. Okay. So they're print materials that your customers who are going to be giving you money are going to see. Okay, great. You want to do digital, right? Are you going to put these on your website? Are you going to put these on Amazon? You need to establish that. Then the other thing you need to establish in addition to that is who is your audience? Is your audience your local city? Is your audience the country you're in? Or is your audience the world? In the case of this umbrella company, it was on Amazon. Therefore, it was digitally the world. And so this AOS, uh, I'm sorry, AOP usage calculator, which is the Association of Photographers Calculator, what you do is you plug in your day rate and then you plug in how long you want the license for. You plug in uh, what kind of media it is, print, digital, or whatever. And then you set your territory worldwide. Uh, it, it like ups, ups your rate like 450%. And so he uses this calculator uh, based off of all these set of circumstances. And then it calculates it into British pound sterling. So if you're in the UK, listen to this, you're good to go. But if you're in another country, you have to like use the exchange rate. But that is how you would establish how you would price a commercial project. And do not be afraid to do this because most commercial uh, houses are just as stupid as your clients and understanding how things work. And so you have to educate them on, on this, but it's okay to say no to a $30,000 project if they don't understand the value of it. Because if you end up having to do a a $5,000 project that you should be charging $30,000 for, you're going to lose so much other business. It's not worth taking the project. You really have to stand firm and you have to turn down this large sum of money because it's not that it's not as large as it sounds. Once you ca- once you calculate it and, and plug it into your operating expenses and all that, you're not making as much money as you think you're making. And so when it comes to commercial photography, I just want to make sure that you're super educated and you don't fuck yourself because these companies that don't know any better will use your images on a billboard and they will not give a fuck or they will not even know that they're doing something wrong. This is why you establish things off the bat and you, you, you start asking them, is this going to be used in print media? Is this going to be, and usually you'll do this in a meeting and they're like, wow, this person's super thorough. That's why they came back with a $30,000 quote because they understood how we work. Now, in the case of this company, they came back, 
the umbrella company, they're like, oh, well, this is super like expensive and blah, 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 blah. And I, and I didn't even, even heard of licensing fees. And I haven't even heard of copyright buyouts. And I was like, well, perhaps that's why you're unhappy with the photographers. And that's why you're contacting me now. Because you don't, you're working with photographers who don't understand how commercial photography works. They don't even understand how to deliver your, 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 your deliverables correctly. And that's why you're unhappy with the result. This is Jason Berkman, and you're listening to the F11 Photography Podcast. I very, 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 very seldom have any shoots where usage rights um, need to even come into the situation. And very often, my my biggest and uh, number one clients are, I get a lot of entrepreneurs who they want my aesthetic and my style to represent their brand or their company moving forward for a long time. And so a lot of these shots are going to go on websites. Um, very seldom do I shoot uh, anything that would ever go on a Facebook ad or a billboard or anything beyond a, a website or, or something like it, an electronic press kit for the, the DJs or anything like that. So a lot of it is just, is just, it's, it's entry, it's entry, um, entry aesthetic and images for a very, you know, personal brand. I'll give an example. I shot stuff for a health and wellness coach. And so I didn't charge them any licensing fees. I just, I knew what they were going to use it for. I knew this person very well. And so I kind of just, I just kind of put it into the cost. Um, I treated it as an extension of a portfolio and that was kind of the end of it. So I just charged them my, my flat day rate plus like a 15% markup and, uh, called it a day and delivered my usual number of photos. Um, but going, going beyond that, a lot of, a lot of the pricing, um, I, first and foremost, make sure you're taken care of, make sure you know the scope of your work and send people a price. Um, oftentimes I don't deal with large companies where I have to itemize a whole lot. So it really just comes down to, uh, given all the aspects, editing time, prep work, uh, location, travel and stuff like that, make sure that you're covered on that and that you are charging enough to make sure that you're eating, uh, what you want to eat. Um, but what we haven't talked about, which it should be implied, is customer service. You know, you don't want to charge someone, know that you're getting money, and then just treat the endeavor like you're rubbing one out. You know, you want to be present. A lot of the times people are there, and they're, they're paying you the money for you. They want the experience oftentimes as much as, as much as they want the deliverable. You know, they want to know that your process is one that they can count on. They want to know that your, your mental presence at the shoot, should they tag along, um, if it's a company, but if it's a sole proprietor, they want to know that you're there 100% for them, you know? To differentiate, uh, Brandon was talking about shooting for smaller companies. Yes. Uh, you can hide your line items uh, and smaller shoots like he does with some of his smaller entrepreneurial brands. You should do that because you'll scare the shit out of them otherwise. But uh, what I was talking about was some of the larger larger projects because some of you listening do shoot the larger projects. And you need to know why you're failing to land these large projects because you're not, you know, you're not establishing the groundwork to succeed. Because the problem is, is some of these larger projects, you end up doing way more work than you thought you'd be doing. And then when you were looking at your paycheck and how much money it's taking away from you because you're turning down all these other projects and you underpriced yourself, you end up not making as much money as you could have. Um, but to Brandon's point about customer service, so I do a mix of creative shoots where there's no money exchanging hands, we're doing portfolio work and all that. And then I have shoots where, um, you know, there is money exchanging hands. So I did a beauty shoot yesterday that was a creative shoot. And right before that, creative shoot I had somebody come in for headshots uh, that was an entertainer guess who got their edits first the person who paid me always i always prioritize paid work also and i mentioned this in a previous episode under promise and over deliver on your times your delivery times and make sure that you have a good handle on your delivery times okay so like i always as a standard tell somebody it could be up to two weeks even though it's usually a week because why not deliver something twice as fast as you promised I always find that to be good. Another thing that you want to establish um, to kind of crack the whip on, you know, getting control of your clientele is one thing that I see people do that I think is a mistake is like, let's just say somebody says, hey, let's go do a headshot session real quick. How much do you charge? And let's just say your rate is $500. You know, my rate's $500. Cool. When do you need the money? Uh, you can just pay me like when I'm done or the day of. Fuck that shit. 
what I do is I charge a non-refundable deposit for a portrait session. It's 50% non-refundable. That is to reserve a date. And so if somebody reserves a date with me, um, I charge them that 50%. And we don't have a shoot until I have a deposit. And the shoot is, it guarantees a shoot on that date. Um, and then if there is like within 48 hours, if I, for instance, like let's say we're, we're mood boarding a shoot where it's sunny outside and I see in the forecast that there's rain in two days. Clearly, we're going to reschedule that. I'm not an asshole who's like, tough, it's that day or no day. We'll reschedule that and that's fine. But if like the day of the shoot, they're like, oh man, can we reschedule? I will usually let them do that once because I do have their 50%, but I say we can do one reschedule complimentary and that's it. And then if it comes to it toward the next time they need to do another reschedule, I'm like, I'm sorry. I've already had to turn down a date. I already had to turn down business on the reschedule date and that's costing me money. I'm keeping your deposit. If you'd like to put down another deposit on another shoot, great. With weddings, the way I typically do it is I do 40, 40, 20. Oh, and by the way, I, 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 the day of the shoot on the other one, they got to pay me the second half the day of the shoot. That's the way I do it. Now with weddings, there's a lot more editing involved and the timeline is a lot more and the expense is a lot more. And let's be honest, if somebody's getting married, their photographer is not their biggest expense. So they have a lot of money uh, spreading out. So I tend to be a little bit more understanding. So what I do when I shoot a wedding, 40% to, re I mean, obviously we have the date reserved because they already know what day they're getting married. So 40% down is what you have to pay me to book me for your wedding. That means that I have reserved that date and I will not do any other shoots with anybody else that day. Non-refundable. And, and, and non-refundable also means if he leaves your ass before, um, you know, the wedding date or whatever tough, because I've committed to that date and you have to, that's not my, that's not my problem. 40% do, uh, usually the Week of the wedding, I, I'm pretty liberal about that. Like, if they could pay me the day of, I don't care. It's just to get me to show up, you have to pay me the other 40%. So now I have 80% in pocket. Then to make sure that they know that I'm working for them, I do my edits. And then I say, okay, my edits are done. Now the final 20% is due. And that's how, I do, that's how I do weddings. So I don't know how you do your deposit system and all that, but I love to hear it. Usually if, uh, to get them on the calendar, it's a $100 deposit. Um I, I really like the idea of a 50% deposit, but, uh, <laughs> it's, uh, I guess I, sh I, I actually might start changing that now because that sounds, uh, really great. But at the same time, I am, uh, very flexible about my, my days, uh, because in, in my, in my day job, I am a 1099. So my schedule is extremely flexible. In fact, the biggest limiting factor to my, uh, to rescheduling is, uh, studio availability. So that's the funniest thing. Yeah, I mean, the reason I do the the 50% is I want a big fucking commitment from them. They're dead serious about this shoot. If they, you know, like if you're if you're charging a thousand dollars for a shoot and somebody parts at five hundred dollars, they're dead serious about this shoot. I'm like, well, they're 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 as into it as I am. That's good. Well, I mean, I sort of weed those people out just by having a premium price to begin with, and they don't. Uh, they don't get their edits till they pay the, uh, you know, the rest of the money down. So, and, and if they want to see the edits beforehand, you know, you bet your ass there's a watermark on there or, or I'm sending them through Google, uh, Google drive where they can view only. And it, I mean, if they decide to screenshot the already like compressed and shitty image, like, you know, whatever, sure. But, um, yeah, no, it's usually when people see my price and, and they put the hundred down, there's, there's definitely a level of commitment because they know that they're not getting the uh the edits until i get the rest of the payment 100 percent, 100 percent. and before we leave for the day i do have one rant that is a little off subject but it's the concept of the watermark so i watermark images when clients are selecting them i am 100 percent on board with that i protect my images but for all of you listening when you watermark your images and you put them on instagram that shit is fucking ugly. And I got news for you. If I'm going to lift your images, I can crop them. I can Photoshop your watermark out. So I don't really know what your watermark is accomplishing other than making your work look more mediocre. Yeah, it's terrible. It's watermarks are for, oh man, watermarks are for guys that shoot elf shoots in the woods. They're the, <laughs> they're the same person. I, you can't convince me otherwise. Well, there's a reason why 
famous painters sign their stuff like super small and very hard to see, you know, in like a lower right or lower left corner. Um, when I see your big branding and I totally understand that like watermarking can also come across as branding and it's your brand and all that. And people know you by your watermark, but I don't think that's what you think it is. People know you by your watermark. They don't know you by your work. If somebody can look at your image and immediately know it's yours and not need a fucking watermark, that's when you've made it as a photographer. I used to watermark my images using my, my DJ logo when I was just out of high school. And I am so glad I no longer do that. I tried watermarking for about two months and it was just, I was like, God, this is just like cheapens my work. It makes it look so ugly. And, um, you know, I went through the process of learning how to watermark and coming up with a custom watermark and I put it on my work. I'm like, I don't like my work anymore when, you know, I'm not saying my work is a work of art, but when I look at other people's works of art, one thing that they all have in common is I don't see their stupid fucking watermark on it. Yeah, watermarking your images, it just basically tells everyone that you go out in public wearing loafers. And that's that's really it's it's that's the person that does it. It's such a watermarking your images in 2023, it is it is more a signifier of what the hell you do in your daily in, in your like time off than what your actual photography is about. I swear it is profiling. It's it's terrible. Well, and people who do watermarking and and people who uh, the people would, who watermark think that Twizzlers are a viable candy during Halloween and and candy corn. You think? Oh my gosh, yes. Okay, good, good, good. We're on the same page there. Candy corn fucking sucks. And if you're listening to this, candy corn fucking sucks. But here's the thing about watermarks: is that we put watermarks on our images because we don't want people to use our images. But here's the thing: the person who will lift your image and steal it, if you sue them. They probably don't have a lot of money because the person that you're going to get your payday on knows better. Do you think Coca-Cola is going to lift your image and put it in a marketing campaign? No, because Coca-Cola has an entire marketing department with a photography budget. And then they go out and they hire a photographer for a concept and they sit down with a marketing team and they put together mood boards and they get through all these pre-production meetings and all that. They're not lifting your image off of Instagram. And we have proof of that, real world proof of that. Remember in our Jordan Groby episode. He, Hi, I'm Jordan Groby. He had a hotel in, um, in California that lifted one of his images and nothing really became of it, right? He had no recourse. He just kind of gave him a stern warning, but he couldn't, you know, there was no, nothing to be sued. Nobody got sued. There was no big payday for, for Jordan. People are going to lift your images, whether you like it or not. The question is, as to whether or not you can get any money back from them. That does it for today's episode. I hope you learned a little bit something about uh, pricing your photography. Uh, maybe you uh, disagree with us. Uh, maybe you have a different method. So uh, maybe go uh, leave some comments in our uh, in our uh, Apple reviews. Give us a five star review and tell us why you disagree with us on our uh, on our methods for pricing, or tell us yeah, why you absolutely. agree with us. Yeah. So uh, follow us at f11pod.com and uh, don't forget to use our ten percent off coupon if you decide side you want to get luminar neo who is our sponsor for today's episode and until next time we love you all chase light and not algorithms thank you for listening to today's episode for more information about this podcast go to www.f11pod.com